who, who was Elihu? He's a, he's a character in the book of Job, isn't he? And we encounter him in chapter 32. Um, we're introduced to him very suddenly as Elihu, the son of Barakel, the Buzzite of the kindred of Ram. Now, that gives us a few little clues about uh, what nation he's from and his family. So Buzz, he's a Buzzite. Buzz was uh, Abraham's uh, nephew. So he's one of the sons of Nahor. Um, so Buzz was Laban's uncle, Bethuel's brother. Um, Buzz, if you look go to Jeremiah 25, um, you'll see that Buzz is listed alongside Dedan and Timar in a list of, um, describes them as Arabian or uh, mingled peoples, the mixed multitude it calls them. Um, and they're linked with, in that passage as well, the land of Uz, which is the setting for Job. And um, when we look at uh, Lamentations chapter four, the same kind of time as Jeremiah, again, we find that it's linked, uh, these peoples are linked with uh, the land of Edom. Um, and then when we think about the setting of Job as well, as him being one of the um, greatest of the men or the people of the children of the East, then we also think about where in Genesis 25, Abraham sent away his children uh, that were not um, uh, uh, Isaac uh, and Isaac's family. He sent them away to the East. And then when... Um, in fact, when uh, Jacob goes to Laban in Genesis 29, it says he came to the people of the east again. So this, so what we get here is both with the, the names in the uh, family of Elihu, the setting that we're in generally, um, and indeed some of the other characters in Job, we're getting this idea of this, uh, the mingled people, the descendants of Abraham that were not um, Isaac's line, and there's this kind of large geographical area to the east of the land that uh, Isaac was uh, to inherit and Jacob, where this, this mixed uh, group of the family of Abraham, uh, Nahor's children, Ishmael's children, Keturah's children, Esau's children, all intermarry. And we have this kind of beginning of the Arab nations, I suppose. And Elihu, from his family fits into this group, as do most of the other characters uh, in the book. So that's the kind of the setting, the kind of background of Elihu. But we only really know about Elihu from what he says and from the way he, he appears in the narrative in Job. And he's actually quite different from every, everyone else. Um, and he's, he's different one of the particular ways he's different is that he, everything he says is absolutely packed full of what everyone else has said. So much so that it's really hard to exhaustively track them all down and find them. And hopefully we'll, we'll be able to see some of that uh, tonight. Um, but when we kind of are suddenly introduced to him, what this shows us is he's clearly been there the whole time because he makes reference to things that have been said through the whole rest of the book. And he also hasn't just been there waiting to say his piece. He's clearly been listening because he's able to uh, refer to what everybody else has said. <coughs> now, let's, uh, let's get into it then. So when we consider Elihu, we've got to consider him in the context of the purpose of the book of Job, haven't we? And it's a, it's a masterfully crafted book. The, the work of the Spirit here is, is amazing because this book, it leads us as the readers into making all the same mistakes as the debaters in the book. We get to the end of the book of Job, we work our way through the book of Job, and we do exactly the same thing. We're trying to tell who's right, we're trying to say who's wrong, we're trying to condemn people. And we often condemn the characters but we don't find an answer. We're still puzzled about what's this all about. And that's exactly what makes Elihu angry and why he starts speaking. Um, he, he's angry that the friends 
had condemned Job but hadn't found an answer. He's also angry because Job justified himself rather than God. And again, the book of Job leads us into this trap. Because when we study the book of Job, and particularly it seems when we study Elihu as well, we end up justifying ourselves and our understanding of the book rather than God. So the, there's something about this book that leads you to experience and learn the, the lesson that it's teaching. It actually makes you live it as you read it and try and comprehend it. But a, a key purpose of this book really is to, is to justify God, isn't it? To show that God is right. That's what happens right at the start of the book, that there's the adversary, the Satan, who, who questions uh, whether God is right. And so we embark on the journey of the book to show that, that God does judge rightly. And as we go through the book, we find out that we're justifying God to show him to be right in the face of uh, human pride, which questions God's methods, his discernment and his judgment. And it ends up showing that God does judge rightly. It shows it to the Satan, to Job, to his friends, to Elihu, and to us, to any reader of the book. And it ultimately shows us that wisdom is with God and it's from God. It's not with us and it's not from us. Okay, so another thing that's very helpful when we get on to Elihu is to notice and, and recognize that we can be factually correct, but not in the right. And I just wanted to take you to the way Elihu concludes. So Job 37, verse 24. And we'll look at this in more detail as we go through. Um, but yeah, um, so he says that God does not regard any who are wise of heart. And we'll see that he includes... He ends up including himself in this, as well as the others that he's speaking to in Job. But he is proved absolutely correct, because I think we'll see that Elihu kind of does betray a little bit of uh, human pride in being wise of heart. And he is absolutely proved correct. God doesn't even acknowledge Elihu. God never makes any reference to Elihu um, by name or regards him in any sense. So he's absolutely correct in that sense. And, and he's, I think he also is correct in a great many ways, and we'll, we'll, see, we'll see that as we work through, but not right, not in the right, because, and this is illustrating the point of the book, that he thinks he has the answer when he's human too. And the answer which he comes up with and, and uh, shares with people is actually about recognition that God knows and God does better than humans. So El Elihu gives that answer, but in the end we're shown that that answer actually needs to be lived, not just spoken. Um, and we see when we're introduced to Elihu that he, he's moved to speak by his wrath, isn't he? That's how we're introduced to him. And your mind might go to James where you, the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. But as we go all through this, this is full of lessons for us because this is a lesson for us. Whenever our emotions rise, whenever we think we're the one that can settle a dispute or a controversy or a complicated bit of scripture, like whether Elijah was right or not, there's lessons for us in this. Elihu is self-aware, though, or becomes self-aware. He notices, and we'll see this, he notices that he's fallen into the trap, the trap of human pride, and he stops right there. So that bit we read, that's the last thing he says. And that's just like Job, who later says, um, chapter 40, Behold, I'm vile. What shall I answer thee? I lay my hand upon my mouth. And I think what we see with Elihu, Elihu is, as well as speaking, he models the response to God for Job. Uh, he says to Job that he's, according to his wish, in God's stead. 
but he says, I am also am formed out of the clay. And he does that. He shows Job, both intentionally and unintentionally, someone who is correct, can be correct, but he's human. And so he's liable to speak in a way that betrays his pride in himself. And though, therefore he has to humbly fall silent before God when God arises. And he models that response, which Job then picks up and does before God later on. Okay, the other thing before we start looking at it is that positions change. In, in all, all arguments, all disputes you've ever been in, um, positions change. Social media is a very good way of illustrating this. If you look down a kind of set of, of comments or a dispute about something, very rarely do people end up holding the same positions that they started with at the top uh, of the post. Um, but the friends and Job through the book, they all develop in their attitude and in their arguments throughout the book. And they do that in response to each other. They become polarized, don't they? More extreme in their arguments. Now, Elihu's attitude and his argument changes too, and we'll see that. But it's not in response to anyone else. It's in response to witnessing the power of God coming in this whirlwind. And it's also because he applies the logical conclusion of his own argument to himself. And what Elihu actually does is he demonstrates climbing down from your position, whereas all the others up to that point had been demonstrating becoming more extreme and entrenched in their position. And that sets the stage perfectly for Job then climbing down from his position when God uh, speaks. Okay, so the other thing I just wanted to say is we all say things that are wrong all the time. And I can almost guarantee that I will say, or I've already said something that's not correct. And uh, I know that there's lots of different views about Elihu. So bear with me and uh, we'll look at this together and see where, where we end up. Right, so let's look at what Elihu actually says and what the, the text, the, the word of God reveals about this character. So Elihu starts speaking, chapter 32, and we can, it, it's well structured, isn't it, the book of Job? It's, it's very structured, and that structure has a part to play in what's going on. But we start off with Elihu explaining why he's speaking. We then have a section where he, he says something to Job. We have a section where he speaks to Job's friends. He goes back to speaking to Job again, and then his concluding, uh, the last two, two chapters, those last two sections I've got on the slide there, they're really one section um, in the way that it's presented in the text. And he, he says, I'm going to speak on God's behalf. But I think we'll see that there's a point in the middle where he changes and his position and his argument changes. So let's dive in at the start. Why is Elihu speaking? So let's, let's read this together and we'll see from this that the answer, it keeps coming back. Elihu wants to share the answer that's burning in him uh, that the friends haven't considered. And, and I suppose the thing they've all been trying to work out is why God works this way with people and um, what it was that Job had done that needed rebuking. Um, so let's, let's work our way, way through this. So these three men ceased to answer Job because he was righteous in his own eyes. Then was kindled the wrath of Elihu, the son of Barakel the Buzzite, of the kindred of Ram. Against Job was his wrath kindled because he, was, he justified himself rather than God. And that's the key point that he will go on to make to Job. This is the narrator introducing Elihu and speaking about his motives here. This is uh, not Elihu describing his own motives. Um, but yeah, so this is the key point that he'll make to Job when he speaks to Job. Uh, then verse three, also against his three friends was his wrath kindled. 
because they had found no answer and yet had condemned Job. And you, you see there that they'd found no answer and he, he speaks to give that answer that he says, thinks they haven't found. Now, Elihu had waited till Job had spoken because they were elder than he. And when Elihu saw that there was no answer in the mouth of these three men, then his wrath was kindled. And Elihu, the son of Barakel the Buzzite, answered and said. Now, I just want to uh, notice here, everything about the book of Job, there's a, a lot of poetic Hebrew poetry structure to this. Uh, I've tried to try and capture that with the way that I've put the text on the screen. But we'll see that Elihu, he, re he very often speaks in, um, in couplets, in parallelisms. And we'll also find there's a lot of um, kind of symmetry in what he says as well. But what we have here, um, so three, four and five, we've got his wrath was kindled against the friends because they'd found no answer. Now, the central point, Elihu had waited till Job had spoken because they were elder than he. And then we go back through again the symmetry. When Elihu saw there was no answer in the mouth of these three men, then his wrath was kindled. So just a, an example there. And we'll perhaps see that there's, there's a point being alluded to here in a minute. Um, so verse six, uh, he said, I am young and ye are very old. Wherefore, I was afraid and durst not show you mine opinion. Now, this word opinion, it comes a few times. It's the Hebrew word day, and it's kind of the idea of my knowledge. It's the same concept as the, uh, the verb yada, which uh, you might know, which is used loads through the book for knowledge, for knowing, for teaching. It's a key debate through the whole book. Uh, who has the knowledge? Who can know? Who is therefore able to teach what is right? Whose knowledge is right? Um, everyone who speaks through the book of Job has something to say on that matter. Um, so he, he does not show you mine opinion. I said, days should speak and multitude of years should teach wisdom. But there is a spirit in man and the inspiration of the almighty giveth them understanding. Great men are not always wise, neither do the aged understand judgment. And again, so that central point there is that it's the spirit, the inspiration of the almighty that gives the understanding. I, I don't want to spend too long on this, but I think uh, I've, I've heard people say that Elihu reveals himself as the narrator of the book. And I think <laughs> people might have a point there that uh, this structure here, where it talks about the inspiration of the Almighty, is actually backing up and saying, like, this is the person that's been inspired to write this book. But just remember, so verse three to five, we had, there was no answer. He waited, and there was no answer. It's all in the third person. This is the narrator talking about um, the people and what's going on. But now, if we come down to verse 15 and 16, we have the same thing, the same pattern. After Elihu has said that there's a spirit in man, the inspiration of the Almighty gives them understanding. We go over the same structure again. They were amazed. They answered no more. They left off speaking. So that's third person. That's the narrator speaking. Then when I had waited... For they spake not, but stood still and answered no more. So we've got the same pattern of the friends don't answer. Elihu waited, the friends didn't answer. But this time we've, we've flipped, flipped between they and I. And I've heard it suggested that that's um, revealing that uh, Elihu could well be the, the narrator um, of this book. But I don't want to spend too much uh, time on that. I think that's, that's just... Uh, an interesting thing to think about. Um, so carrying on uh, back in verse nine, great men are not always wise, neither do the aged understand judgment. And this is referencing a key point that's come up time and time again. Um, Job 12, uh, for example, I'll try and pick out a few of the times when he references what people have already said. 
but it, it's basically every other verse. So, so we'd be here all night if, if we did that. And it's worth um, having a look in your own time, to follow the words back through the book. Therefore, I said, hearken to me, I will also show mine opinion. And you see, we're still going through this kind of symmetrical structure here. Verse 11, behold, I waited for your words. I gave ear to your reasons whilst ye searched out what to say. Yea, I attended unto you. And behold, there was none of you that convinced, that uh, convinced where it comes elsewhere, it's chastened. I'm not quite, I, I guess I can see from the context why people have wanted to say convinced here. Um, but in the rest of the arguments in the book, it's people talking about chastening. Um, or that answered his words, lest ye should say, we have found out wisdom. God thrusteth him down, not man. And we've come to a really important point here because Elihu is reveal, he's starting to reveal what he thinks the answer is by saying, um, so he's speaking so that the friends wouldn't say, we found out wisdom, God thrusteth him down, not man. Now, there's two ways of reading it. You could read this, oh, he's, he was listening to see whether they said that because um, that's what he thinks and, that, and he wanted them to be right. Um, but he didn't hear that. I don't think that's the case. I think he's actually here saying, this is why I'm speaking. Um, I will show you my opinion because I'd waited. And I'm going to show you my opinion lest you should say this. And <clears> the <throat> reason why I say that is that they did actually say this. Um, and later on, his point is that God, that man has thrust him down, not God. So um, that's why I'm saying this is what he doesn't want the friends to conclude. And um, so, yeah, it's interesting. And again, he's, he's referring back to things that have happened before. So that word thrusteth him down, it's, uh, it's not a particularly common phrase, but it came earlier in Job uh, 13, verse 25, where Job asked God if he would break one who was like a leaf driven to and fro. And it's that that is translated here as thrusting down. Um, and... That word in the Psalms is used for God driving away the wicked. Um, but actually, God was uh, not doing that to Job. And Job's point to God was not that um, he was the one uh, driving him to and fro like a leaf. He's asking God, he, he, he's complaining to God about what the friends are doing and saying, God, are you going to break someone who uh, is being uh, driven to and fro uh, like this? And I think we'll see that it's the friends and the adversary that are the ones with the intention to thrust Job down. And Elihu's point here is don't conclude that God thrusts him down not man, because man is the one that's thrust him down. That's not talking about all the suffering that's happened to him. We'll see what that's talking about uh, in due course. Um, and this gets to his point, his, his answer, I suppose, which we'll see come out more and more, the, this um, is that he, he's giving them the reason for Job's entrenched position. And he's saying that this is because he's been thrust down by man, by scoffers, by wicked men, and ultimately by his friends. OK, so then he goes on. Now, he has not directed his words against me. Neither will I answer him with your speeches. This isn't the same word that's answer everywhere else here. This is him making a point at the friends. This is a, um, a word that's kind of got a lot to do with conflict and retaliating. So I, I'm not going to retaliate to him like you've been doing. I, I want to provide an answer. So he, he's kind of saying, well, you've just been rebuffing him or countering him. You've not really been listening and answering him. <clears throat> then again, yeah, there's this, this structure. They were amazed. Um, he had waited, mirroring that same structure of verse three to five. Then verse 17, I said, I will also answer my part. I will show mine opinion, for I am full of matter. It's um, 
I'm not quite sure why it's translated matter there because it's speaking and words nearly everywhere else in the book of Job. Um, the spirit within me constraineth me. Remember he said he thinks it's the, the spirit, the inspiration of the almighty that gives man understanding. It's not um, particular age or greatness that, that does that. My belly is as wine which hath no vent. It's ready to burst like new bottles. I will speak that I may be refreshed. I will open my lips and answer. So he's, he's described his motivation, hasn't he, in this, this section, that he feels like the spirit of the Almighty has given him understanding and he's compelled to speak. Um, but there's coming quite clearly out of here an element of wanting to show his opinion, his knowledge, to be the one that has the answer. And we can feel that too, can't we? We can, we can both feel that we've, we've found God's answer revealed uh, in the spirit word rather than human thinking, but we can also still be motivated by some sort of pride and some sort of desire to be the one that's right, can't we? Okay, so let me not, I pray you, accept any man's person, neither let me give flattering titles unto man, for I know not to give flattering titles. In so doing, my maker would soon take me away. And again, he's referencing back to Job chapter 13 there. Um, there's been this dispute around whether the friends are uh, accepting God's person and not properly considering Job's argument um, because of that. So that's, that's why Elihu's speaking. He wants to give this answer and he's also... Um, angry with the friends because they hadn't found an answer but had condemned Job and with Job because he justified himself rather than God. So now in chapter 33 he goes on to speak to Job. Wherefore Job I pray thee hear my speeches that's that same word uh, that was translated as matter that he had within him hear, hear this that I've got to say to you hearken to all my words and you can just start to see here how so much of what Elihu says is in these couplets, um, these parallelisms. Behold now, I have opened my mouth. My tongue hath spoken in my mouth. My words shall be of the uprightness of my heart. My lips shall utter knowledge clearly. We see this kind of attitude uh, coming out again, don't we? But the spirit of God hath made me. The breath of the almighty hath given me life. If thou canst answer me, set thy words in order before me. Stand up. Behold, I am according to thy wish in God's stead. I also am formed out of the clay. Behold, my terror shall not make thee afraid, neither shall my hand be heavy upon thee. He is directly answering things that Job had asked earlier on in the book. And the friends hadn't done that. Um, and uh, so I guess what we have in this verse uh, one to seven here um, is that Elihu, he, he's, he's actually heard, he's actually listened <laughs> to Job's plea for someone, please listen to me. And uh, Job, I mean, it's Job 13 again, um, verse 19 to 21, if you want to have a look at that uh, later, that this where Job says these things and he's directly answering that plea from Job chapter 13 and the friends didn't listen they th they did thrust him down Elihu says I won't do that but he does still have a message for Job and in fairness Job did ask for someone to plead with him for someone to to talk to him uh, in that way okay let's let's go on Verse eight, surely thou hast spoken in mine hearing and I have heard the voice of thy words saying. Now some of this is direct quote. Some of this is a summary of what Job had said uh, or ended up saying, shall we say. Um, I am clean without transgression. I am innocent. Neither is there iniquity in me. Behold, he findeth occasions against me. He counteth me for his enemy. He putteth my feet in the stocks. He marketh all my paths. And this, this is a very uh, good representation of what Job has said. Some of it's word for word. And what Elihu does here, 
um, he reflects back to Job the position that the friends had pushed him to. And just notice, he's, he's just saying back what Job has said here. He's not attacking Job like they did for imagined wrongdoing that was a reason for his suffering. Um, let's carry on. Behold, in this thou art not just. I will answer thee that God is greater than man. Why dost thou strive against him? For he giveth not account of any of his matters. For God speaketh once, yea, twice, yet man perceiveth it not. And just note the colours here on the screen. So he says, God doesn't give account of any of his matters. There's no, like, no one can hold God to account for what he does. It's entirely up to God uh, what he does. But he then says, God speaks once and twice, but man doesn't perceive it. And he then goes on to say what that once, what that twice is, and how man can perceive it. So the once in a dream, in a vision of the night, when deep sleep falleth upon men, in slumberings upon the bed, then he openeth the ears of men and sealeth their instruction. That he, that he may withdraw man from his purpose and hide pride from man. So he's saying, God speaks in this way to people for this reason. He keepeth back his soul from the pit and his life from perishing by the sword. So God speaks in dreams to people and it's to turn man away from pride and to save his life from the grave ultimately. Um, now that's a running theme throughout the argument so far, Job's dreams and others' um, commentary on, on dreams. And Elihu has picked up on this, says God does actually speak through dreams. Um, okay, and then the twice, God speaketh once, yea, twice. The twice, he is chastened, so man uh, is chastened also with pain upon his bed and the multitude of his bones with strong pain, so that his life abhorreth bread and his soul dainty meat. His flesh is consumed away that it cannot be seen, and his bones that were not seen stick out. Yea, his soul draweth near unto the grave and his life to the destroyers. So Elihu's point here is that God actually speaks and communicates through suffering. He's not saying that this happens to anyone because of what they've done. He's saying God speaks in this way. God doesn't have to give account of his matters, but he does speak once, twice, but man doesn't recognize it, doesn't perceive it. And we see that then, if there be a messenger with him, an interpreter, one among a thousand, to show unto man, and that's um, the same word as that, uh, man doesn't perceive, this is to make man perceive uh, his uprightness. So, and that's a reference back to Job 9, um, verse 3, where Job had asked for one or, or looked for one among a thousand that could contend with God to show God a man's righteousness and that there wasn't such a one that could, could do that. Um, and Elihu's point here is that the one among a thousand is actually to show man God's righteousness. It's not finding the one person that can make the case to God that the man is righteous. It's the other way around. It's the one that will actually help the man perceive the way God is speaking, be the interpreter, the messenger, and show man God's uprightness. And if there is that one among a thousand, I, I, I just want to remark, I suppose, that's the atonement concept, isn't it? That our representative shows God's righteousness. God's righteousness is shown by his grace to consider us one with Christ. Christ didn't contend with God's wrath to make us just and right with God. He showed us God's righteousness by what uh, was done. Um, but yeah, so, so if there is that one, that can help man perceive this way that God is being righteous and communicating with man, then God is gracious unto him and saith, 
Deliver him from going down to the pit. I have found a ransom. His flesh shall be fresher than a child's. He shall return to the days of his youth. He shall pray unto God and he'll be favorable unto him. He shall see his face with joy for he will render unto man his righteousness. He looketh upon men and if any say I have sinned and perverted that which was not that which was right and it profited me not. He will deliver his soul from going into the pit and his life shall see the light. And it's using the same language here, isn't it? This is why God was speaking through the dream, why God was um, communicating through that suffering to achieve these things with a person. Um, Lo, all these things worketh God oftentimes with man to bring back his soul from the pit, to be enlightened with the light, light of the living. So Elihu's point here is that God acts to save, not to destroy. And, and that's absolutely correct, isn't it, based on the prologue of Job, that God was doing this to show that Job was upright and to justify God in his judgment to, to the Satan. Elihu doesn't say that the sin is the cause of the suffering, but he does say that God acts to turn a man from his way and particularly to turn man from pride. Um, Mark well, O Job, hearken unto me. Hold thy peace and I will speak. And this, this poetic structure comes out again. If thou hast anything to say, answer me. Speak, for I desire to justify thee. If not, hearken unto me. Hold thy peace and I shall teach thee wisdom. And in the middle there, we've got that Elihu desires to justify Job. The friends don't appear to have that as their motivation. They came to comfort, but they end up condemning Job, not justifying. Okay, so then Elihu's got a message for Job's friends. Chapter 34. Now, remember, he said that they had condemned but not found an answer. And I'm just going to try and summarize what I think he's saying here, and then we'll work our way through. So he's, he's, he's saying that they're, they're wrong. They were wrong to condemn Job, that they were wrong to say that the suffering was coming because of his sin. But what he does say in here is that Job has ended up saying things that he should not. But it's because they pushed him to it. He does say that the, his answer, the real problem, the answer they should have found alongside their condemning of Job, the problem with Job's words is that he justified himself and not God. That wasn't a problem with Job at the beginning of the conversation. That wasn't in Job's words at the beginning. It, it, so Elihu is not saying that these words are a reason for the suffering as the friends made out. What he's saying, and we'll, we'll see this, is that they caused it. They caused Job to say these things. And Job, I mean, so Elihu's point is that Job was correct about his righteousness, but he was not right to say it instead of justifying God. Um, now, as we read through this, at first, he seems to agree with the friends. But remember, he's angry. He believes they're wrong. And he's saying something. He's actually telling them why they're wrong in this, this section. Um, but he, he does agree on something. He agrees that Job needs rebuking for something. But yeah, just, just to reiterate, it's, it's for his answers to the friends, not his life before the suffering came. Um, and just at the end, we'll, we'll notice that he says he wants Job to be tried to the end, not condemned. He doesn't condemn Job. And that's the word, um, that tried word is the word that Job uses about what God is doing to him. Why must you try me, test me every moment um, in uh, chapter seven? It's something that multiple psalmists acknowledge that God does and even um, ask for God to do to them. Um, 
He also agrees with the friends through this that God is righteous and not unjust. And that's actually common ground that everyone holds in the book of Job, that God is righteous and not unjust. (laughs) Now, they all hold this common ground at the beginning, but through their disagreement on how that works in practice, then we find that the friends push Job away from that common ground. And then... They've not, they end up not speaking what's right about God themselves, so they kind of step away from it as well and leave it there in the middle. But Elihu does agree with them, and this is all in the context of people who believe in uh, God and believe that God is righteous and just. They just, uh, they're arguing about how that works. Um, and remember what he'd said, just said before. So his point here is that God is communicating to save Job through the suffering. And it's not because Job was a worse sinner than anyone else. And he goes on to say here that it's wicked men that have thrust Job down and mocked and scorned him. And that's why Job answered the way he did and stepped over the line. And his error is in the response that the friends drove him to, not his life uh, before the suffering came or the position that he had at the start um, when the friends started disagreeing with him. So let's start reading through. So furthermore, Elihu answered and said, Hear my words, O ye wise men, and give ear unto me, ye that have knowledge. For the ear trieth words as the mouth tasteth meat. Again, that's a quote from earlier in Job chapter 12, uh, verse 11. Um, This is something that they'd been uh, saying to each other, um, my friends and Job. Let us choose to us judgment. Let us know among ourselves what is good. For Job hath said, I am righteous, and God hath taken away my judgment. Should I lie against my right, my wound is incurable without transgression. So at this point, I imagine if you were the friends, you're thinking, yeah, yeah, he did say that. Um, And then he goes on to say, what man is like Job, who drinketh up scorning like water? Now, he's actually quoting Eliphaz here. But Eliphaz said that Job drinketh up iniquity like water. And Job said that you, my friends, you are scorning me. So what Elihu's done is put them together and say he's not drinking up iniquity like water. He's drinking up your scorning like water. So what man is like Job that drinks up scorning like water? Which goeth in company with the workers of iniquity and walketh with wicked men. He's now actually saying his companions are the wicked ones. So this is actually an attack on the friends who had been scorning him. And where Job said his friends were scorning, that's chapter 16, verse 20, as I'm reading for today, actually. Um, And then he goes on to say, for he hath said, it profiteth a man nothing that he should delight himself with God. Therefore, hearken unto me, ye men of understanding. So he's still speaking um, to the friends or, or to all, I suppose. But he's saying really that they hadn't found an answer because they hadn't listened. They're they're just still trying to find a sin that's the source of the suffering, not answering Job for where they pushed him to err in in this regard. Far be it from God that he should do wickedness and from the Almighty that he should commit iniquity. For the work of a man shall he render unto him and cause every man to find according to his ways. Yea, surely God will not do wickedly, neither will the, will the Almighty pervert judgment. Everyone's actually been agreed on this point. They've just disagreed as to how it seems to be uh, in life. Who hath given him a charge over the earth, or who hath disposed the whole world? If he set his heart upon man, if he gather unto himself his spirit and his breath, all flesh shall perish together, and man shall turn again unto the dust." So then now he he pivots, if now thou, and I think he's starting to talk to to Job, but there's something for everyone that's listening to to take from this. If now thou hast understanding. So if you're here thinking you've got understanding and everyone who's spoken to this point has said that, um, hearken to the voice of my words. Shall even he that hateth right govern? 
Wilt thou condemn him that is most just? Is it fit to say to a king, thou art wicked, and to princes, ye are ungodly? He's pointing out the problem with uh, the implications of what Job has been saying um, to God here. And to princes, ye are ungodly. How much less to him that accepteth not the persons of princes, nor regardeth the rich more than the poor, for they are all the work of his hands. In a moment shall they die, and the people shall be troubled at midnight and pass away. The mighty shall be taken away without hand, for his eyes are upon the ways of man, and he seeth all his goings. There is no darkness nor shadow of death where the workers of iniquity may hide themselves, for he will not lay upon man more than right, that he should enter into judgment with God. He shall break in pieces mighty men without number, and set others in their stead. Therefore he knoweth their works. And this is a point Job had made. God, you already know everyone's works. So why is this happening? And he overturneth them in the night so that they are destroyed. He striketh them as wicked men in the open sight of others. So he strikes mighty ones like uh, wicked ones in the open sight of others because they turned back from him and would not consider any of his ways. So that they cause the cry of the poor to come to him and he heareth the cry of the afflicted. When he giveth quietness, who then can make trouble? When he hideth his face, who then can behold him? Whether it be done against a nation or against a man only. So God works this way with nations and with uh, individual people. That the hypocrite reign not, lest the people be ensnared. So all the way through here, he's, he's, he's making a point about why God does this, as well as the fact that God is so mighty. Who are you to contend with him? Surely it's meet to be said unto God, I've borne chastisement. I will not offend any more. That which I see not, teach thou me. Remember what he said about why, how God communicates, but man doesn't perceive it. If I have done iniquity, I will do no more. Now, actually, Job had said these things. Should it be according to thy mind, he will recompense it, whether thou refuse or whether thou choose, and not I. So Elihu's point here is that God is just. God will do what's right in judgment and in teaching. But it's absolutely God's decision how he does this. It's not Job's friend's decision. It's not um, Job's decision. And it's not their decision based on their observations or per perceptions about how and when the wicked should be judged and the righteous rewarded. And he's also saying um, that, or he goes on to say that, to say that God always acts how you have witnessed or perceived, and therefore, as the friends had said, that he's causing someone suffering because of their sins is to speak without knowledge. And it's the same for Job, who's been pushed to implying that God should not be acting as he was because of Job's righteousness. Therefore, speak what thou knowest. Let men of understanding tell me. Let a wise man hearken unto me. And I think there's a clue here that he's both presenting back to them. So let men of understanding tell me their conclusion about Job, but also giving something for Job to think about. Let a wise man hearken unto me. Job hath spoken without knowledge, and his words were without wisdom. Now, initially, this is Elihu reflecting back what the friends had told him. They said it, um, it's Job chapter 15, verse 2. Um, Job had also pointed out that this was their implication to him um, in chapter 12, verse 2. But then Elihu goes on to say what he thinks. My desire is that Job may be tried. Remember, it's tried unto the end because of his answers for wicked men. And this is a new point. This is a point that's not been made by any of the friends or anyone to this point. This is the answer that Elihu is giving. It's the reason why Job had done something that needs trying, needs testing. It's that the three friends, the wicked men, drove him to give the answers. And so, so when he's saying, like, listen to this, your Job has said this thing that's wrong, but he's, he needs to be tried to the end because of his answers for wicked men. 
and and that's that's kind of got to make them stop and think. And then it says, for he addeth rebellion, and again, I don't know quite why it's rebellion there because it's transgression everywhere uh, everywhere else, and it's come up repeatedly throughout the book. Unto his sin, he clappeth his hands among us and multiplieth his words against God. And uh, so, first of all, looking at he addeth transgression unto his sin. So he's picking up on Job's language here. Um, go to Job chapter 7, verse 21, because there Job acknowledges that he has sin, that he is a, uh, he's a human, he's a mortal man, and he has sin. But his confusion carries on. Um, chapter 13, verse 23, this is one example of this, that when he says, he, he asks God about where he's confused about his transgression is that he doesn't understand what sin, what transgression would be a reason for the suffering. Um, and in fact, that's his argument, isn't it? That suffering isn't a direct immediate consequence of personal sin. And there wasn't, was there? There wasn't a sin that was the reason for the suffering. And Job says to God, are you making me remember all the sins of my youth? Um, but God wasn't. God saw that Job was righteous and upright. But Elihu uh, is pointing out that Job's been pushed to the point where he's adding a transgression unto his, his sin. And I don't think that's a that's not a specific sin like the, the friends have been talking about that has caused his suffering. We've seen that that's not Elihu's point. He's saying this is something new that's been added to the self-awareness of his uh, sinful flesh that Job has um, described earlier on. And then he says, he clappeth his hands among us. Now, again, you read this straight away and you think, oh, it's saying that Job's got a really brazen attitude, isn't he? But when we follow that phrase, um, the way it's used, clappeth uh, his hands. So it comes in a uh, number. I'll just go through the references. If you want to write them down, you can have a look at them later. It's Numbers 24, verse 10. Job 27, verse 23. Uh, Jeremiah 31, verse 19. Um, Lamentations chapter 2 verse 15 I can give these afterwards as well and Ezekiel 21 verse 12 there's not that many occurrences of this but it's, a, it's always a sign of frustration anger despair or disgust this isn't like someone clapping his hands in um, rebellion or a brazen attitude um, Elihu is still describing why Job has said this. He's like clapping his hands in frustration. No one's listening to him. The, it's the scorning, the, the answers he's been driven to give um, for wicked men. And he multiplieth his words against God. So he's saying this is what the frustration that he's got with you has driven him to do. He's driven him to add this transgression to his sin and multiply his words against God. He's ended up implying things against God because of what you the three friends have done. Okay, so then he turns back to Job. And he addresses Job about this problem with what he's ended up saying. So he's not attacking, it's different from the friends. He's not attacking Job as a person. He doesn't ever say that he's suffering because of this either. Um, that it's a punishment for what he's done. He doesn't say that. Um, thinkest thou this to be right, that thou saidst, my righteousness is more than God's? For thou saidst, what advantage will it be unto thee? And what profit shall I have if I be cleansed from my sin? And just notice again, he reflects back what Job has said. Uh, he's been listening. Um, and just remember as well that, Job, that Elihu's view is that Job's sin is justifying himself rather than God. And that that came after his suffering when his friends um, the wicked men pushed him to it and thrust him down. Um, I will answer thee and thy companions with thee. Look unto the heavens and see, and behold the clouds which are higher than thou. If thou sinnest, what doest thou against him? Or if thy transgressions be multiplied, what doest thou unto him? If thou be righteous, what givest thou him? Or what receiveth he of thine hand? Thy wickedness may hurt a man as thou art, and thy righteousness may profit the son of man. And what he's saying here is like God is so much greater than us and wants to turn us from our sin. It's for, it's for our benefit. It's not for God's 
benefit. God's being gracious. Um, by reason of the multitude of oppressions, they make the oppressed to cry. Um, the son of man, that is. They cry out by reason of the arm of the mighty. But none saith, where is God my maker, who giveth songs in the night, who teacheth us more than the beasts of the earth and maketh us wiser than the fowls of heaven? There they cry, but none giveth answer because of the pride of evil men. Surely God will not hear vanity, neither will the Almighty regard it. So Elihu's point being that um, wickedness happens, the oppressed cry out, they receive no answer, and that's if they're crying out without recognizing that God gives everything to us, he teaches us through suffering. This is Elihu's point he's made so far, isn't it? But if they do recognize that, then they recognize, as he said already, that God's already answered. And Elihu also made, made the point, and he repeatedly makes the point, that God teaches through these things. And God uh, appears not to give an answer to these people because of the pride of evil men. That, that concept comes out again and again. God is teaching humans humility. Um, Although thou sayest thou shalt not see him, Yet judgment is before him, therefore trust thou in him. And he's reminding Job of this reality, which his words were starting to say was not so, despite Job having affirmed this multiple times earlier on. And he's referencing back what Job said earlier in his argument before he was pushed to um, the extreme. Um, but now, because it is not so, so what's not so? I mean, Job's righteousness wasn't greater than God's. Um, also, Job didn't see God, um, verse uh, 14. Uh, he wasn't seeing God's teaching hand, um, verse 11. Um, but also, neither were the companions, who are also the target of this speech. Um, look at verse 4, I will answer thee and thy companions with thee. Um, and neither, indeed, was the, the adversary, the Satan, whom God was actually teaching at the beginning. They weren't recognizing that God's righteousness was greater, that um, he was actually teaching in all of these things. Um, so because it is not so, he hath visited in his anger, yet he knoweth it not in great extremity. Therefore doth Job open his mouth in vain, he multiplieth words without knowledge. So God has visited in anger. That point's not actually in debate. Everyone has said this in what they've said so far. He's saying Job doesn't know in his extremity that he, he just needs to climb down from his position and acknowledge God's uh, supremacy and that God is teaching through this. Now, in fact, we know from the prologue that God's not actually primarily initially teaching Job. He's teaching the Satan, the adversary. Um, I don't know that Elihu is necessarily aware of this, um, but then it's for this reason that because there's not this recognition that God's teaching, um, that it says Job is speaking words without knowledge. He's not saying that he's wrong about uh, suffering not being a direct and immediate consequence for sin, but that he's questioning God. He's without knowing that God's just looking for humility and the abasing of human pride. And again, it's not just Job's pride, uh, it's which kind of had it been provoked to arise by the friends, but um, it's the, the Satans who thought he knew better than God. It's the friends who think they know better than Job and that they completely understand God. And it's, it's us as the readers who think we know better than all the characters of the book and, and each other as well. So then Elihu ventures on to speak on God's behalf. And this is where he falls into the trap big time. Um, so he proceeded and said, suffer me a little. I will show thee that I have yet to speak on God's behalf. I will fetch my knowledge from afar. I will ascribe righteousness to my maker. For truly, my words shall not be false. He that is perfect in knowledge is with thee. It seems like quite a statement to make, doesn't it? Um, and it's a statement, isn't it, that it betrays this, this flaw that surfaces in 
in all the characters of the book except the Lord. Uh, and actually, I, I found uh, in myself when I'm reading the book and coming to conclusions, um, this this flaw emerges of thinking that we're perfect in knowledge and we're we're the one that's right. Um, we'll come back to that later, though, once we've examined what his, his point is. God is mighty and despiseth not any. He is mighty in strength and wisdom. He preserveth not the life of the wicked, but giveth right to the poor. He withdraweth not his eyes from the righteous, but with kings are they on the throne. Yea, he doth establish them forever, and they are exalted. And if they be bound in fetters, and holden in cords of affliction, then he showeth them their work, and their transgressions that they have exceeded. He openeth also their ear to discipline, and commandeth that they return from iniquity. If they, uh, so I just make a point there. So this is the point, isn't it, that Elihu is repeatedly making that God acts to teach, not just to bring instant judgment. And that's a point that hadn't come out in any of the arguments so far. So if they obey and serve Him, they shall spend their days in prosperity and their years in pleasure. So He's saying if they respond to this teaching, this command from God, um, which is different actually from the point that the friends were making earlier. Um, but if they obey not, they shall perish by the sword and they shall die without knowledge. But the hypocrites in heart heap up wrath. They cry not when he bindeth them. They die in youth and their life is among the unclean. He delivereth the poor in his affliction. He openeth their ears in oppression. And so he's saying like God does judge if his teaching is ignored. But remember his point in the previous chapter that this is according to God's mind, not ours. God sets the time and the means, and that could be different every time for every person because God knows best. He doesn't have to act according to the rules that we might reason exist because of our experiences so far in our lives. Um, so even so, he would have removed thee out of the strait into a broad place where there is no straightness. And that which should be set on thy table should be full of fatness. But thou hast fulfilled the judgment of the wicked. And so he's kind of saying, well, if you respond to God's teaching, you should be full of fatness. But what you're full of at the moment is the judgment of the wicked. And judgment and justice take hold of thee. This kind of concept is not fair. Because there is wrath, beware, lest he take thee away with his stroke then a great ransom cannot deliver thee. So the ransom that God's trying to bring, he won't deliver you if you don't respond to his teaching. Will he esteem thy riches? No, not gold, nor all the forces of strength. Desire not the night when people are cut off in their place. Take heed, regard not iniquity, for this hast thou chosen rather than affliction. So Elihu is warning Job, don't desire death, as we've seen that Job has, because that's what God can bring to people who've refused to listen and learn. And there's no more opportunity for them to learn. The affliction is to teach, he said that, hasn't he? But Job's been put to the point, pushed to the point, where he might be prevented from learning from the affliction, even though the lesson was originally intended for others. <coughs> and Elihu here, he, he equates choosing to die before having learned the lesson about pride with choosing iniquity. But notice he's still speaking to Job as to someone who's still got the opportunity to choose. He's not saying that Job's a sinner and he deserves to be judged or that his suffering was that judgment already, which was the, the friend's point. He's saying this is a lesson and you've got an opportunity to learn from it. If you choose not to learn from it, then you're actually choosing iniquity. Now, we then carry on, it's, it's the same section as I said, but there's a, there's a marked change here in Elijah's final speech. And he said at the start, one that's perfect in knowledge is with you. But now he starts to see something. He starts to witness something, God's power in the storm. And he actually goes back on what he said before about being perfect in knowledge. And if he's been listening to what he's been saying, his own words, then he, this is the logical application of his argument to himself because he can't refuse to learn from the experiences that God brings upon him as he starts to witness the emergence of this storm. 
Um, he can't exalt his own knowledge instead of his creator's. And he ends up saying things, and we'll see it. God does things we can't comprehend. God is great, and we can't know him. Um, and it changes, it pivots at this point, once you start seeing this behold, see language coming in. Um, and it's triggered by something that everyone can see. So, um, behold, God exalteth by his power, who teacheth like him, who hath enjoined him his way, who can say thou hast wrought iniquity? Remember that thou magnify his work, which men behold. Every man may see it. Man may behold it afar off. Behold, God is great, and we know him not. This is actually the opposite of what Elijah said at the start of his speech, um, that he had perfect knowledge about God. Neither can the number of his years be searched out. For he maketh small the drops of water. They pour down rain according to the vapour thereof which the clouds do drop and distill upon man abundantly. So he's just starting to see rain. Behold, see these things. Also, can any understand the spreadings of the clouds or the noise of his tabernacle? Behold, he spreadeth his light upon it and covereth the bottom of the sea. For by them he judgeth the people and giveth meat uh, in abundance. And I mean, this, this is his, his point, isn't it? I'll just, just go back to verse 22, actually. Who teacheth like him? God is teaching in all of this, even what they're now witnessing arise before them. Um, by them he judgeth the people, he giveth meat in abundance. Um, with clouds he covereth the light and commandeth it not to shine by the cloud that cometh betwixt. The noise thereof showeth concerning it, the cattle also concerning the vapour. So there's, there's light, there's uh, clouds, there's rain, there's uh, noise. Um, seems like there's, there's thunder. Uh, this also my heart trembleth and is moved out of his place. Hear attentively the noise of his voice. Something's happening, the sound that goes out of his mouth. He directeth it under the whole heaven and his lightning unto the ends of the earth. After it, a voice roareth. He thundereth with the voice of his excellency and he will not stay them when his voice is heard. So see, here, there's something happening. God thundereth marvellously with his voice. Great things doeth he, which we cannot comprehend. For he saith to the snow, be thou on the earth, likewise to the small rain and the great rain of his strength. He sealeth up the hand of every man, that all men may know his work. And the beasts go into dens and remain in their place. Out of the south cometh the whirlwind. And later on, God will speak out of that whirlwind. And cold out of the north. By the breath of God, frost is given. The breath of the breadth of the waters is straightened. And he causeth, verse 13, it to come, whether for correction or for his land or for mercy. Hearken unto this, O Job. Stand still and consider the wondrous works of God. And then just notice from where he started saying, I'm going to share my knowledge. My knowledge is perfect. Now it's, we can't know. Do you know when God did this? Do you know uh, when God did that? Um, but verse 19, he's starting to apply it to himself now. Teach us what we shall say unto him. For we cannot order our speech by reason of darkness. It's getting dark now. Shall it be told him that I speak? If a man speak, surely he shall be swallowed up. And remember, we're right at the start, chapter 32. It was a long time ago now, wasn't it? Um, Shall, shall it be told to, like, I'm going to speak because I've got this answer. But now he's saying, well, shall it be told him that I speak? And, and now uh, people don't see. And his conclusion, touching the Almighty, we cannot find him out. He's excellent in power and judgment, plenty of justice. He will not afflict. Men do therefore fear him. He respecteth not any that are wise of heart. And he's come to this. This point, so from saying that he was perfect in knowledge, he's now come to the point where he's recognizing that God is perfect in knowledge and that uh, men therefore fear him and he doesn't respect any that are wise of heart. And at this point, he takes his own advice and he holds his tongue. He, he stops talking. I think he, he realizes at this point that he's been wise of heart and he risked magnifying his pride in the answer that he had to give above the almighty that he'd concluded is the one who holds all the answers. 
And just notice, there's no attempt by Elihu to justify himself at this point or his intentions to go back, oh, I was doing it because of this. He just falls silent before the Lord. And it makes me think of um, Mephibosheth before David. So Elihu, just, just to kind of conclude. So Elihu, he, he perceives that the friends hadn't found the answer. And the answer that he says is that they were the ones that had caused Job to sin with his lips. That God was teaching through Job's suffering. He's not bringing direct retribution for sins that Job had committed. He appears to understand, um, perhaps correctly, that there's a fault with the position Job's been driven to, um, that he is righteous, and it's human pride that is manifest in these things. But then perhaps he realizes that he's fallen into the trap too by the end, because um, he's been so driven to share his knowledge as the answer to the conflict. And therefore, he, he, he completely, perfectly models the response then that Job will himself take when he witnesses God's authority. And when, jo when God speaks, Job takes the question that God asks uh, uh, to himself, and he again, does exactly what Elihu did. He doesn't say anything. And the, the kind of answer then is, is this acknowledgement of God's supremacy, this abasing of human pride, but that that actually needs to be lived and experienced, not just theoretically understood. Um, having said all of that and spoken for far too long, I think I'll follow Elihu's example and fall silent now. <laughs>